Hello everyone, this is Dr. Frances Monroe with today's presentation on chronic kidney disease. This slide presentation is based on a comparative effectiveness review, CER, or systematic review entitled Chronic Kidney Disease, Stages 1 to 3, Screening, Monitoring, and Treatment, which was developed by the Minnesota Evidence-Based Practice Center for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ. This study is also available online. Please check the references. A systematic review that included over 110 reports of eligible studies that were published from January 1985 through January 2011 was undertaken to determine the potential benefits and effects of screening, monitoring, and treatment for adults with chronic kidney disease. Data sources were taken from searches of Medline and the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews uh, from 1985 through 2011. Manual searches of reference lists of identified systematic reviews and primary reports were also included. This presentation will also give you an overview of chronic kidney disease, available treatment options, clinically important questions, and a summary of the conclusions regarding the effectiveness and harms of screening and treatment. We will also look at gaps in the knowledge base and what providers should discuss with patients regarding the treatment of chronic kidney disease. Throughout this slide presentation, uh, you will see strength of evidence ratings that are assigned to different findings of the report. The strength of evidence is usually assigned to reviews of medical treatments after looking at four domains, uh, the risk of bias, consistency, directness, and precision. Again, this graph and chart shows you a review of each of those uh, four broad ratings. So let's look at the public health impact uh, from chronic kidney disease. It's estimated that almost 27 million adults in the United States have chronic kidney disease, which is almost 12% of the population. This is according to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and Haines data uh, through uh, 2007. The prevalence of chronic kidney disease is rising for every stage with more than 500,000 Americans receiving uh, dialysis or treatment for end-stage chronic disease in 2007. It's predicted by the end of 2015 more than 700,000 Americans will have end-stage uh, renal disease. The prevalence increases with age. It's a little bit higher in women than in men. And currently annual chronic kidney disease screening is recommended by the American Diabetes Association, the National Kidney Foundation, uh, JNC8, and the American Heart Association. Patients with chronic kidney disease are at an increased risk for mortality, cardiovascular disease, fractures, bone loss, infections, cognitive impairment, and end-stage renal disease. Chronic kidney disease is usually asymptomatic, except in the most advanced stages, usually stage 4 and stage 5. Let's take a look at the specific definitions of each stage of chronic kidney disease. As you can see by the slide, stage 1 is considered uh, kidney damage with a GFR greater than 90 mLs. Stage 2 uh, talks about a mildly decreased GFR of between 60 to 89 mLs per minute. Stage 3 is broken into stage 3A and B, GFR 45 to 59, GFR 30 to 44. And then we get into stage 4 with a severely decreased GFR, 15 to 29, and then kidney failure or dialysis with a GFR less than 15, usually treated by either dialysis or transplantation. Chronic kidney disease can be caused by primary kidney diseases, such as glomerular diseases, obstruction, or polycystic kidney disease. But in most patients with chronic kidney disease, the kidney damage is associated with other comorbidities, such as diabetes and hypertension.
Other risk factors uh, for CKD include uh, older age, history of cardiovascular disease, certain ethnicities such as African American, Native American, Hispanic, and a family history of chronic kidney disease. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey uh, looked at the prevalence of diabetes among individuals uh, with and without chronic kidney disease, and it did increase um, to over uh, 24% among individuals uh, with diabetes. If they looked at hypertension, almost 64% of patients with chronic kidney disease in stage 3 suffered from hypertension. So the prevalence of comorbidities was much higher uh, in the population of diabetics and hypertensive patients and the older Medicare population. A thorough initial investigation for the evaluation of chronic kidney disease includes determining the causes and type of disease and evaluating for comorbidities. The patient's medical history, family history, physical exam, vital signs including blood pressure and weight measurements are the most valuable parts of the CKD evaluation. Laboratory tests should include measurement of serum electrolytes and glucose, fasting lipid panel, and a urinalysis should be performed to evaluate uh, for the presence of albumin, creatinine, and uh, measure the protein-creatinine ratio. Additional testing may be required to look at rare causes of CKD, and renal ultrasound is recommended to evaluate kidney size and assess for any possible structural abnormalities, including the presence of tumors, stones, or cysts. Chronic kidney disease is usually detected by measuring serum creatinine levels in order to calculate the GFR and by measuring the urinary albumin creatinine ratio to detect proteinuria. The most common causes of CKD are diabetes and hypertension, but the disease can be caused by other conditions. Uh, Urinalysis can detect signs of glomerulonephritis, tubulo-interstitial disease, vasculitis, hereditary nephritis, and lupus, but it's usually not recommended in otherwise healthy patients. The GFR is the best measure of kidney function, and the normal GFR varies by age, sex, and body size. A GFR less than 60 mLs per minute represents a loss of at least one half of normal kidney function, and below this level, there's an increased prevalence of chronic kidney disease complications. Proteinuria refers to increased excretion of any urinary protein, including albumin and other serum proteins. Urine dipstick testing, however, is insensitive for the measurement of small amounts of albumin and is not recommended for chronic kidney disease screening in patients at risk. Patients with a positive urine dipstick result should repeat the test in the absence of any UTI, ketosis, or hypovolemia. If the second test result is positive, then the urinary protein-creatinine ratio should be obtained within three months. Persistent proteinuria can be diagnosed by two positive protein-creatinine ratios one or two weeks apart. Let's take a look at some of the factors that impact the potential benefits of screening adults for CKD in the early stages. This is according to the systematic uh, review that was done and looked at whether undiagnosed CKD is prevalent in the population overall or just in certain high-risk groups. Looking at whether CKD is associated with significant adverse health effects or increased health care costs, whether it it is accurately diagnosable while it's asymptomatic, looking at whether there are valid and reliable screening tools that are acceptable to patients and available in primary care offices, and whether there are treatments available for patients with CKD that can improve uh, important health outcomes. The Comparative Effectiveness Review, or CAER, analysis looked at different treatment options for adults with chronic kidney disease, stages 1 to 3, and the review was restricted to randomized controlled trials that enrolled adults uh, in this study.
They looked at treatment using ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers versus diuretics, different diets, and multi-component interventions. Studies were examined that compared active treatment of patients with CKD uh, with placebo and included combination treatment and comparisons with the same active treatments using different dosage levels or targeting different treatment thresholds. The review was restricted to studies that reported clinical outcomes. The primary clinical outcomes that were studied included reducing mortality and incident of end-stage renal disease, some secondary clinical outcomes that were studied included uh, the risks of cardiovascular complications, including MI, stroke, and congestive heart failure, along with quality of life issues. Intermediate outcomes include uh, reducing the incident stage 4 of chronic kidney disease, doubling of creatinine, and having of the estimated uh, GFR. The greatest emphasis was placed on the primary outcomes of mortality and end-stage renal disease. Some of the questions that this systematic review also looked at were the benefits and potential adverse effects of screening for CKD. They wanted to know is there direct evidence that screening is associated with improved outcomes and are there any potential harms that are associated with systematic CKD screening. They also looked at the benefits and harm related to effects of monitoring for CKD. Is there any evidence that monitoring can worsen kidney function or kidney damage? Uh, and does it improve clinical outcomes? What are potential harms associated with ongoing monitoring for worsening kidney function and disease? So let's look at the uh, group treated with ACE inhibitors. In patients with overt proteinuria, diabetes, hypertension, ACE inhibitors did decrease the risk of end-stage renal disease by 40% versus placebo, and uh, the strength of evidence was moderate. However, in patients with stage 1 through 3 kidney disease and only having microalbuminuria or impaired GFR, ACE inhibitors did not significantly reduce the risk for end-stage renal disease when compared to placebo. Next, let's look at the treatment group uh, of patients who were using ARBs. Uh, when compared with placebo, ARBs reduced the risk of end-stage renal disease by 22%, but again, only among a subgroup of patients with overt proteinuria. Most of these had diabetes and hypertension, uh, and this had a high strength of evidence. Patients with proteinuria, diabetes, and hypertension may benefit from either an ACE or ARB treatment. The clinical bottom line uh, looking at risk for end-stage renal disease in patients screened early on uh, shows that there was not a significant difference between these comparisons. Uh, beta blocker versus placebo, calcium channel blocker versus placebo, calcium channel blocker versus beta blocker, statin versus control, uh, strict versus standard blood pressure control, low protein diet versus a normal diet, and a low carb, low iron uh, enriched diet versus a low protein diet. Looking at the risk for mortality in patients with CKD early stages treated with either ACEs or ARBs, the risk for mortality was not significantly different for these comparisons. ACE versus placebo, ARB versus placebo, ACE versus ARB, ch calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, um, ARBs versus calcium channel blocker, and again different combinations of ACEs and ARBs uh, with diuretic. So one of the conclusions in this study was that in a sub-analysis of patients with microalbuminuria who had cardiovascular disease or diabetes, uh, treatment with an ACE inhibitor did significantly reduce mortality risk when compared to placebo. The relative risk reduction was not significantly different in similar patients who did not have microalbuminuria.
Patients who have this problem and were at high risk for cardiovascular complications may benefit from ACE inhibitor treatment at adequate doses, and this had a strength of evidence that was moderate. The bottom line regarding screening and monitoring is that evidence was insufficient to determine if systematic ongoing screening of high-risk adults uh, with chronic kidney disease stages 1 to 3 has any direct effect on clinical outcomes or adverse effects. The indirect evidence suggests that uh, potential harms from screening and monitoring may include misclassification of patients with chronic kidney disease, unnecessary testing, with potential associated adverse effects, increased costs, psychological effects of being labeled with CKD, adverse effects from pharmacological agents uh, that are initiated or changed after diagnosis, and potential insurance ramifications of a new diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. Indirect evidence uh, from the treatment outcomes of this uh, systematic review do suggest that screening populations at high risk for developing chronic kidney disease, again, patients with diabetes, hypertension, or heart disease, and ongoing monitoring of these patients who already have early signs of kidney disease uh, may help identify those who have CKD stages 1 to 3 and those patients may benefit from early treatment with an ACE inhibitor or ARB and or a statin. So conclusions of this systematic review again are that patients with early uh, chronic kidney disease with overt proteinuria who have diabetes, hypertension, um, and ACE or ARB will reduce their risk of end-stage renal disease. Uh, patients with only microalbuminuria or impaired GFR, the ACEs did not reduce their risk when compared to placebo. There's no increased benefit for reducing the risk of end-stage renal disease uh, if the ACE and ARB were taken as combination therapy when compared to taking them alone. And taking the ACE or ARB did not reduce the risk of overall mortality except when the ACE was used for patients with microalbuminuria heart disease, or diabetes. Some additional findings from the systematic review included that statins reduce the risk for mortality, MI, and stroke in patients uh, with hyperlipidemia and impaired GFR. Beta blockers may reduce mortality in patients with congestive heart failure and impaired GFR. And many patients did experience improved outcomes uh, if they had pre-existing clinical indication for treatment regardless of their CKD status. Fortunately, adverse effect events were reported in only a few of the clinical trials, and these were already known potential adverse effects uh, from these treatments, such as myopathy from the statins. The systematic review also pointed out some gaps in the knowledge base where evidence is not clearly available. <clears throat> so again, looking at whether systematic screening uh, for CKD in patients at high risk uh, or monitoring does affect clinical outcomes. And is there any value in just a one-time measure of albumin or GFR? Uh, does that have the specificity and sensitivity to diagnose persistent CKD or progression? And are there any um, differences in clinical outcomes for specific treatments between patients with recently worsened kidney function when compared to those with stable chronic kidney disease? And what is the long-term impact of treatment on clinical outcomes? Um, and one last uh, knowledge uh, area would be the impact of dietary interventions uh, or intensification of treatment. So things such as the DASH diet, tight versus standard blood pressure control, a high versus a standard uh, statin dose on the clinical outcomes for patients with CKD in the early stages. What specific things should you discuss with your patients? Well, it's important to talk with them about the presence and stage of any chronic kidney disease, uh, the risk of chronic kidney disease if they have diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease, acute kidney disease. You may want to share with them the evidence about the benefits and adverse effects of treatments for chronic kidney disease, uh, doses adjustments for medications that they may be taking,
and definitely giving them a list uh, of drugs to avoid um, that are associated with nephrotoxicity such as contrast material, NSAIDs, lithium, sulfonamides, dilantin, uh, vancomycin. Um, you may want to download a complete list for them and uh, give them additional resources. There's a nice uh, pamphlet available through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, talking about medicines for early stage chronic kidney disease. Um, it is a free patient resource and it can help uh, patients talk with their healthcare provider about different options for treatment. It talks about causes and symptoms of CKD and the role of medications in helping to protect kidney function. There's a website listed where you can order electronic copies uh, for your patients.